start by telling you a little bit about myself. Uh, first off, when I speak, and I'm a proud member of recovery, um, I've been around the programs of Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, Heroin Anonymous, you name it, any A, I've been there for a while, about 33 years. Um, have I been sober 33 years? Fuck no, okay? <laughs> I have been sober, uh, what's today? Today is November 15. My sobriety date is November 15, 2020. That's today. And the reason I tell you that is because it's irrelevant how much time somebody has under their belt. Mm -hmm. It's irrelevant. It's a 24 hour a day program. What's the world's record in sobriety? Anybody? 24 hours, right? <laughs> it is. Uh, I do have a sponsor. My sponsor's name is John Mack. That's a nickname. Uh, I will be giving John his, uh, and I share this with his permission, of course, 48-year um, token on St. Patrick's Day. How does anybody get sober on St. Patrick's Day? <laughs> well, he did it. So uh, I'll be giving him his 48-year chip if he doesn't pick up between now and, and March, whatever that date is. And I honestly don't think he will um, because he does what I do. And uh, what we believe is that if I do what I do today, if I do what I did yesterday today, I've got a really good chance at staying sober today. And by the way, it works. So um, I'll tell you the difference between a 48-year um, chip, which uh, like I said, I'm gonna give him, and this chip right here, which is the white chip, the only difference between a 48-year chip and that is the color, it's the color. It's a 24-hour it's a program and it works if you put the work into it. I am living proof of that. I have a home group. My home group is the Wilkins Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, we started that group in uh, March of this year when COVID hit, uh, because all the AA and NA and every meeting shut down. So uh, I got permission to uh, use the uh, facility at um, University City United Methodist Church. It's located on the corner of W.T. Harris and uh, Sugar Creek Road, not far from here. Uh, we meet on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays at 8 p.m. Uh, and you are all welcome. And we'd love to have you there. Uh, it's a large group. We have anywhere between, um, typically between 40 uh, to, we've had as many as 96 people. And uh, it's all people that are there for one reason, and that's recovery. Um, so there's my housekeeping. Um, uh, quick question for the group here. Uh, my story contains uh, alcohol and drugs. Does anybody here use drugs? <laughs> Is anybody here going to be offended if they come up with my story? Good answer. Neither am I. Because my name's Dirk Rustoven and I'm a real addict and alcoholic. And like I said, I know who I am. I break my anonymity every day I get out of bed because I don't care. Uh, I'm allowed to do that because it says right in our, in, in our A traditions, in our, in our laws, if you will, and there are no laws, there's no rules. All right, this is governed by you guys and me. Um, but I'm allowed to break my anonymity anywhere, anytime, in public and private if I want to. But I will not break any of yours. That's a guarantee. Okay, so uh, that being said, um, I tend to be a little bit profane. I will do my best to watch it, but you know, shit. Oops, I'm only human. <laughs> Every time I swear, I'm gonna pay for it. Now, I don't like to part with my money, so I'll do my best to watch my language. Um, so my whole point being here today, first off, it's an honor and a privilege. Anytime, anytime recovery asks me to speak, um, it's, it's awesome. It's, I, couldn't, I couldn't ask for anything more for the day. Uh, and like I said, it's a 24-hour day, so tomorrow, nah, we'll deal with it. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share with you three things, okay? It's, I'm gonna tell you what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Uh, I'm gonna try and keep it to about 10 minutes on each because I really wanna spend the majority of the time on what it's like now, but it's very important that I qualify, okay? First off, I'm not a drug addict, but if I drink, and you've got Xanax, we're probably gonna finish them. And I'm not gonna remember shit. I'm not a drug addict, but if you've got cocaine, I'm gonna snort it and we're gonna smoke it until it's gone. And then chances are I'll be the one buying more because I'm the only guy in the house that has a bank card. And that's only gonna last that night, you know that, right? I'm not a drug addict, but if you've got Dilaudid or morphine, I'm gonna shoot it straight into my veins and I'm gonna use your needle to do it. Because that's the way I use and I, it's the way I drink. When it's on, it's on. I do not stop 
until I'm incarcerated, hospitalized, institutionalized, or dead. And I've been to all four of those parties, okay? So what was it like? In the beginning, it was a damn lot of fun. It was, because you know, when we started, there were no consequences. You know, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I started when I was 11. And um, you know, I, uh, I had my first drink prior to that, but I got drunk when I was 11. Um, interestingly enough, I got drunk on a, a quart of Michelob beer with a neighbor kid where we had two quarts of Michelob and I, he, go, he pulled them out of the freezer and I said, who are those for? He goes, for me and you. And I was like, yeah. You know, I didn't know what I was getting into, but you know, I'm, the, I'm, I'm one of the big kids because this kid was old, man. He was like 14, you know? So, um, right. So we drank those two quarts of Michelob. Um, I think I had a little more of his than I, and after finishing mine. And I remember the feeling and I remember loving it. Uh, loving it. There was no question. I drank to get drunk the first time, and I did. Uh, that was, I'm going to say, a Tuesday. I drank again on Wednesday. I got drunk. I drank again on Thursday. I got drunk. I drank again on Friday. I got drunk. And then I drank again on Saturday. And I got drunk, and I got sick the first time. And then I said, oh, my God, I'll never do this again. And that lasted until about Tuesday. Um, so that was the early uh, days. And by the way, I will let you know, um, I had 10 years of sobriety, and then I turned 11. Anybody get that? <laughs> so, uh, so that's just that, that's what, it, what. So, what was it like? It was a lot of fun, but of course, doing all these things, I got into a lot of trouble as kids do, because you know we don't know how to behave and control ourselves, and then especially when we put things into our bodies, we're going to act a fool, and typically we're going to get caught. <laughs> so I did. I started getting caught. My mother remarried a devout Christian guy, Dutch Christian reform. This is up in a place called Holland, Michigan. Um, I'm stumbling home, just drunk. You know, and like neighbor kids leave me on the doorstep and stepdads throw me into a cold shower. Not that that does anything, but piss me off. And, uh, and what I was doing was I was really disrupting their marriage. And they probably wouldn't have survived, honest to God. They stayed married 35 years until he died. But they, um, they decided that it was in their best interest to send me to military school. So you know how, how the parents threaten kids? Like, you're bad, you're gonna get sent to military school. I'm one of them that really went. Okay, so I got to military school at 12, and I was with 900 other bad kids. We weren't, I don't consider myself a bad kid, I just smoked a lot of pot and drank, you know, but I wasn't really bad, and, uh, but to them I was. So I ended up in this, in this military academy in Lexington, Missouri, and I got news for you, man, I learned to drink the way I wanted to. Uh-huh, so I started to, um, we had to sit at our desk and study every night, and uh, from 7 to 9.20, and with a 10 minute break in between. And if we, we had to sit at our desk, we didn't have to study, but um, we had to sit at our desk. So what I did was I bought a quart of Everclear, which was 190 proof grain alcohol back then, or I bought a fifth of Bacardi 151, liter, I'm sorry, not a fifth, liter of 151. And I found, because I couldn't walk into the dorms with a suitcase of beer, I'd get caught, you know. We were allowed to smoke cigarettes, but we weren't allowed to drink or smoke pot. We did all, everything else too. So, but I could walk into my dorm with a liter of Everclear and 151 underneath my coat of my uh, military issue uh, raincoat, no problem, and that would get me drunk twice. So I would sit at that desk every night and I would drink Everclear or 151. I'd drink about half of it, which is equivalent to a fifth. And I was doing that at 12 and 13 and 14 and 15. Mm. That's a lot of booze, man. But to me, it wasn't. To me, it was normal. Um, it's just what I did. And I had a reputation there shortly of being the guy that could drink more, hold his liquor more. Well, you'd pass out, I'd be finishing your shit. And uh, that's just, you know, what I did. So I, um, I, and I, and it was a badge of honor. It was like, to me, it was cool. Um, so I did all that. I ended up going to college. Uh, I graduated from high school, which I wouldn't have if I'd stayed back in Holland, Michigan. That's a fact. I graduated with honors, gotcha. And um, went off to a place called Grand Rapids, Michigan. Because I wanted to go back to where these kids were that I left, you know, when I went to Missouri. And show them just how cool I was now. And so I went to this college, <laughs> Dutch Christian Reform College, called Kelvin College. I lasted less than a semester. Um, I drank a fifth of vodka every night. I switched to vodka because it was $5.27 a fifth. I will never forget that number, nor will I play it in the lottery. Um, but I spent it every day. No matter how broke I was, I could always find $5.27, right? No matter what, you know, we're gonna get what we get. And, um, and when they kicked me out, they, they raided my room and I had been stashing all these empty bottles because I was too drunk to go throw them away, like smart addicts and alcoholics would. So I'd stick them in the back of this couch, not behind it, but in it. And they, they searched my room, they found nothing. They came back in after my roommate, who turned out and knocked me off, 
um, for obvious reasons, I was a, I was a liability. And uh, they came in, they pulled the couch out, and they pulled 120 empty fifths out of the couch. And this was in less than a, uh, this about three and a half month period. They lined them all up in the hallway, 120 of them. They weren't all mine, but a whole bunch of them were. And uh, I remember sitting there like, yeah, is that all you got, 120? You know, you're getting kicked out, right. I'm gonna do better than that, I'm gonna quit. So you don't even have to give me a board hearing, I'm out of here. So that was the first time I was homeless. Um, I went into the restaurant industry at an early age, which I stayed in my entire life. Uh, I loved it because there was a guy in the kitchen called the chef, and he'd scream louder, he'd swear more, he'd drink more, he'd work harder, he'd stay up longer, he'd do more dope than you, him, or her, or anybody else. And I was like, I want to be that guy. And guess what? I became that guy. Um, and I became wildly successful doing it. Uh, a crazy, it's, we're very driven people. So I ended up, uh, making a career out of that because of two reasons. One, I enjoyed what I did, and two, I could drink at work. Back in the 80s and the 90s, I could drink at work. And by the way, the cocaine was free because every server had it. Hey, chef, you want some coke? You know, your order's up. Hey, chef, when's my order gonna be up? About 40 minutes, you want some coke? Your order's up, right? I mean, it was just wild, you know, so, it, it, and I loved it. Again, the consequences weren't there. But then they started to happen. I got married, by the way, at 21, days after my 21st birthday. I stayed married to that woman for 20 years somehow. Um, and uh, she was with me through a lot of this ugliness, but then she left me for the worst. Um, so anyway, uh, I never, I started to not drink in bars because it's very expensive unless other people were paying for it. So I did the majority of my drinking for free at work and at home. Um, I started to get threatened, like I'm gonna leave you and I'd be like, okay, what do you want me to do? And she'd go, go to rehab. And I'd go, okay. So I'd go to rehab. And I'd get straight for, you know, seven days. Or I'd walk out after three or one. You know, and so I started this whole series of going into uh, detoxes and rehabs. And I've been through about 45 of them in my life. Um, and if I, you know, I wasn't there to quit. I was just there to get somebody on you know, my back problems. Get her off my back, get the boss off my back, get the cops off my back, and get the judge off my back. So um, it's not gonna do any good. So I started to have a little bit of the consequences. I didn't get any of the DUIs yet or anything. And everybody would say, all oh, these are yets. And by the way, they're right. So um, I hit 30, I ended up in, uh, or 32, I ended up in North Carolina. I lived in about seven states prior, um, doing some big jobs. I was covering the whole half of the country, driving drunk every single day, multiple times a day. Uh, through DUI checkpoints and never got caught. I mean, just crazy stuff. But then uh, then I had a daughter. I had my daughter at 32, um, actually just turned 33, and um, I was gonna change my life. That lasted about a day. I was drunk in the, the uh, hospital the night before, I was drunk in the delivery room. Um, that's a fact, and I'm not proud of it, but that's what I did. And at that point, I was completely addicted. I could not go without drinking, because I've been shaken since I was in my, like 20. You know, because, you know, I'm detoxing. Um, and I thought that was the worst of it, you know, being sick, not being able to get out of bed, whatever. I can deal with that party. I've been there a thousand times. What's different about this one? You know, don't eat, don't sleep, sweating behind your kneecaps and arms and balls and whoop. And uh, everything, you know, it's, it's really horrible. So, you know, but the real consequences hadn't hit. So I went and got another great job. Um, I was the executive chef for the largest hotel here in Charlotte. Um, stayed sober for about six months of that year and a half, started drinking again, it was all downhill. Uh, anybody here ever relapse? Okay, let me ask you this question. When you went back out, was it worse than the last time? Yes, a resounding yes, that's a fact. So that had started to happen with me too. So I kept going in and out of these rehabs and I was actually trying at this point, but um, it, got, uh, it got bad. So my wife finally left me uh, days before my 40th birthday. Well, she left me at about 39 and a half, and I was making a shit ton of money. And um, I was a corporate chef or a distributor. I covered the whole country, flew me all over, I had an unlimited expense account to drink on, and I was paid to take customers out and get drunk. It was great for an alcoholic, but it would have killed me. So I was doing this, so I got this great idea. Well, my wife's leaving me because I'm traveling so much. Yeah, that's a problem. So I'll quit my job. So I did. I quit my six-figure job. I held up in a uh, one-bedroom furnished apartment in Mooresville, North Carolina, and I drank nonstop for six months straight, morning, noon, and night. And I had my narcotics delivered, and I never left that apartment except to get more. And that's the honest truth. For six months, I didn't know if it was three o'clock in the afternoon or three o'clock in the morning, and I didn't give a shit. 
I didn't care. As long as I had what I wanted, and I always did. So after that six months, I'm still trying to get my wife back, because you know, that's one of the things we always try and do is get back what we lost. So I got this another bright idea. I said, well, I'll call my minister to baptize my daughter, and he'll help me get sober. So he comes over and he says, well, Dirk, you're an alcoholic. And I'm like, yeah, no shit. We've been going around with this for a couple of years already. You know, he knew me. I was no new news to him. And he goes, well, quit drinking. I said, well, there's a novel thought. So I did. I stopped immediately. I ceased drinking alcohol on the spot after doing the six-month bench. I'd never heard of, del I heard of delirium tremens. I thought they were delirium tremors. I thought that meant I was just going to shake a lot, puke, not be able to get out of bed, eat, and be sick and miserable for three days. Like I said, I've been to that party. I didn't think anything of it. First three days sucked. 72 hours after my last drink, DTs kicked in. And what delirium tremens are is it's your body, it affects your central nervous system um, because of the copious amounts of alcohol that I'd had for decades, uh, and all of a sudden ceasing it, you, your body goes into shock. Um, it starts with ambulatory audio hallucinations. You hear things that aren't there. You'll hear music playing in another room and there's nothing playing. Um, I heard voices outside my apartment. I lived on the third floor. I heard right outside my window, clear as a bell. Went, snuck over to the door, opened it up. Guess what, there's nobody there. Um, and that's how it starts. The second day was when I started having visual hallucinations. Um, I started seeing wisps behind me. And I'd turn my head and there'd be nothing there. And then I'd see it over here and I'd turn my head, there's nothing there. By the end of, uh, and then that night I had very vivid dreams. Horrible, horrific. Dreams. Uh, I literally experienced going to hell, and I experienced this dream twice. First time I observed, and uh, the second time I was a participant. It was horror. And uh, so I woke up from that, and that's when the real visual hallucinations kicked in. Um, I would see you as clear as a bell, as sure as I'm looking at you, and you're not there. Uh, I ran out, of, I'm not going to dwell on DTs, but I will tell you this I ran out of my apartment with no clothing on at 3 o'clock in the morning. I thought my daughter was dead and my ex-wife was dead. I found my daughter, she died in my arms when I was in delirium tremens, and it was a hallucination. But I will tell you this, I know what it's like to lose my daughter because it really happened to me. That's how real this shit is. And uh, I didn't know she was alive until uh, five and a half days later. You must stay in DTs for almost five days. Uh, if you're not hospitalized, it kills you. Um, there's only two withdrawals that kill, the benzodiazepines and alcohol. Those are the only two that'll kill you. Heroin will drop, you'll wish you were dead, but it won't kill you. Uh, alcohol and benzos will. So I was at that party um, and I somehow survived. Uh, you'd think that I quit drinking at that point? No, I didn't. Um, I went into uh, DTs four more times um, after that, but none were as severe as the first time. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this, but I did keep benzos around to help taper my body off when that would happen. And there was only one time I didn't have them, that almost killed me too. So there's, uh, you know what it was like, it was fun until it got out of hand. Now I'm telling you what happened. DTs are the first of four specific things. The second specific thing I'm gonna tell you is I moved to, no, this happened before I forgive me. I was living in a heroin den motel. This place reminds me exactly of where I lived. Exactly, I mean, two level, this, it was in Statesville, North Carolina. It's been mowed down now. But it, I mean, literally walking through the, the courtyard, I'm like, holy shit, I lived here. And by the way, they're all the same. They're all the, the heroin den motels across the world are all the same. And uh, so I was living there. I went into detox because I was running out of detoxes because I didn't want to go into DTs because I knew I'd die. So I'd go into state run free detoxes. So I, I went into the one in Statesville. I've been in there a dozen times at least, by the way. Um, but I went in there to get sober safe and get medically detoxed. And I met uh, this guy. What's your first name? Josh. It's not really Josh, but I'm going to pick on Josh. So Josh and I meet in detox on the day one that I'm in there, right? Because it's seven days. And Josh and I become best friends. Josh and I are going to save the world. And we're going to stay sober together. And we're going to get you all sober too. And Josh and I bonded. Josh and I couldn't have been thicker than thieves, man. Josh and I could have been born brothers. Well, I got out the day before Josh. And uh, I immediately went back to my heroin dumb motel and I was drunk within an hour. Why? Because I didn't have a plan. I didn't have anything planned other than hanging out with Josh. And by the way, we were going to move to Florida. Great. <laughs> Josh gets out of the uh, detox the next day and I pick him up already drunk. Uh, we end up that night in Winston-Salem smoking crack for four days straight. Mm. 
and uh, never, never like sore, sore the place. And um, and I drank the whole time. Um, he stole my car twice, stole my wallet, stole my money, and I kicked him out. Sorry, Josh, you got to hit the road. So I'm I'm in the heroin dumb motel. I throw him out. I am wasted, laying on. There's two beds. I'm laying on the second bed, and I'm watching the front door. He's swearing, you know, I won't do it again. You know, please, let's go to Florida. Let's do, let's save the life. You know, save the world. And I'm like, get the fuck out. So he's on the phone and he, he makes a supposable phone call and he packs his bag and he um, walks out the, the door. So I'm laying there and I got one eye open. I got my cell phone and my wallet, my keys in my pocket and I'm under the covers. This guy came, this happened in like 10 seconds. The guy came back in the room, shut the blinds with one hand, turned around and walked over between the two beds and I looked up and he was standing over me like this and he had about a seven pound chunk of asphalt in his hand and he went, BAM! And he slammed it down on my skull and he left me for dead. Knocked me out cold. The only reason he didn't finish the job, well, two things happened. It was asphalt and it was in July. So the asphalt actually crumbled. If it had been a rock or concrete, I'd be dead from that, just that. So, um, and then he ran out the door to steal my car after taking my wallet and, and keys and phone. And the door shut behind him and he locked himself out of the room. He left his bag. And he's uh, and everything, and they found my car the next day, and they found him two days later in the same crack neighborhood, and he's in prison right now uh, for life because of that. So anyway, I didn't die. I came to blood was uh, blood all over the bed. I passed back out, came back to a second time, called nine one one, and they saved my life. So you'd think that would make me stop? No, didn't. I just moved to Gastonia instead. Great neighborhood. Uh -huh. And by the way, if anybody knows Gastonia, I lived in Fern Forest in Gastonia, great neighborhood in the middle of the armpit of America. Yes, I was there. And uh, so that was awful. I did some dangerous stuff for about two and a half years there. Very dangerous. And um, again, I'm checking into state-run detoxes. Now I'm in a place called Phoenix in Gastonia where they know me by name. And they still know me by name, by the way. Um, but they know I'm recovered. Uh, so anyway, I checked back into uh, detox. I drove there because I knew if I had to quit drinking, I was going to go into DTs and I was going to die. So I'll just drive over to detox and they'll take me in. So I did. And I drove over there and they gave me a breathalyzer. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. I drank all night, you know, and for weeks on end. And I blew a 0.47. Yeah, I know, right? Mm -hmm. I've blown actually one time higher than that. And I, because I didn't, uh, I was in detox at 25. Well, I should have been dead, according to them. You're like, 4.7. And I'm like, yeah, you know, so. They're like, you gotta go to the emergency room. I'm like, no, I'm not, because I don't have insurance. And they're like, no, you gotta go. And I said, fuck you. And they said, okay, well then you're gonna sit in the lobby and we're gonna detox you right here with Gatorade. Took them 12 hours to get my BAC down to a 3.5, which back then they admitted you. Now they don't even take you if you're over a 2.5. Lucky for me. So anyway, they admitted me at 11 o'clock at night. And then at six, anybody here been in Phoenix? Good deal. Then you know in the morning they walk in the hall and they go, Vitals! Get your vitals! And everybody screaming. So all these women, they scream it. So we all have to stumble out of our room and file down the, the hall to get our vitals taken. Well, I was in the last hall on the left. Last room on the left of that hall. I remember feeling really weird. And it was like an act of Congress for me to cross that 12-foot hall to the, to the railing. And I got about from me to you, you know, 10 feet away from the nurse's station. And I went, bam, and I fell right out and had a stroke. I didn't have a seizure. I had a full on stroke. Uh, I was in a wheelchair for 15 days. They kept me there for 15 days, seven day program. I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk. I, ha I knew what I wanted to say to you, but I couldn't articulate my words. And it should have, you don't recover from a stroke. I made a full recovery. And you'd think that'd be enough to make me quit drinking. Not even close. So I went back out. I did grasp sobriety. Um, I will tell you this, I tried the marijuana maintenance program. Um, and I would even tell people in AA it would save my life. It doesn't work. Uh, it worked for me for three and a half years. I didn't touch a drop of alcohol, but I was miserable. And I smoked pot the same way I drank, which is every waking minute of the day. And at the end of that three and a half years, guess what I did? I ended up going back to the one I loved. And then with it came everything else. So my last, uh, what, what happened was I decided to do some controlled drinking. Nobody was gonna catch me. I was good, nobody was home. <laughs> Wife was out of town. Uh, I would only get one 18 pack of beer and nothing else. I did get 8.4% beer. I'm not stupid, I'm an alcoholic. So uh, I get my 18 pack and I drank it in a matter of you know three, three and a half hours. And of course it wasn't enough. 
and I wanted more, but I knew I couldn't drive legally and I didn't want a DUI. So my brilliant addict alcoholic mind said, hmm, I got a prescription for Ambien. I'll just take one of those and that'll you know, jump my buzz up to where I want it to be. And I remember taking the first Ambien, but I don't remember taking 56 more. Mm -hmm. And I died. Uh, I came to 40 hours later in the ICU with uh, tubes hanging out of me, a heart monitor on, um, an alarm on the bed, and a doctor standing over me going, you're supposed to be dead. And my first words back to him were, but I'm not. That's how arrogant I was, but I'm not. And he said, uh, if you drink, you're gonna die. And I said, okay, thanks. Um, I guess I won't drink. Uh, that was the beginning of my last drink. And my last drink lasted 17 days. So from that moment on, I drank every day because I'm gonna quit later that day, or I'm gonna quit tomorrow. And I kept doing it. And I finally got my ass on a plane, and I went out of state to a detox. And I, when I walked in that detox, uh, I, and I drank a shitload on the plane and everything on the way there, that's you know, another story. But I got there and I didn't have another drink and I have not had one since, and I don't plan to. Because again, if I do today what I did yesterday, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna make it to midnight without a drink. Um, when I walked into that program, I, I said to myself, I'd worked the 12 steps twice, twice, and I failed. So I said, I went in there with three things. One, where did I screw up? What did I do wrong? Second, I'm gonna get a sponsor. Well, I'm here, I'm not gonna wait. And third, I'm gonna work these steps fearlessly and thoroughly. Mm -hmm. The key is thoroughly because I had the fear. I'd been dead a number of times. I didn't wanna go again. So I did, I ended up finding the most hard ass sponsor um, that you could possibly wish. And uh, it was the best thing that ever happened for me and I love the man. And I still talk to him every single day. Not Verbally, I send him the same text that some of you in this room get, where I send out two things I'm grateful for every day. Uh, one of them goes to Jerry. Uh, so I, uh, I worked the steps with him. Um, somewhere between six and seven, the obsession to drink and juice was actually lifted from me. And I had no clue what that was, guys. When I hear, heard that for decades in AA, I thought the obsession to drink and use being lifted meant that I was always gonna be thinking about it, because I had been for, you know, ever, for my whole life. And it meant that I was gonna to have to tell myself that it wasn't there, and that it was a bad idea, and that I didn't want it, even though I did the whole time. I thought that was the obsession being lifted. I got news for you, it's not. The obsession to drink and use was taken away like that. I woke up, and I didn't even know what happened. I didn't have a burning bush, I didn't have a bolt of lightning. I woke up, and it was, something was different. And then I met with him later on that day, and I said, Jerry, I just feel good, I, I, I don't know what's going on. He goes, let me ask you something. Have you thought about having a drink at all today? And I'm like, uh, no. For the first time in 38 years, no. And uh, he's like, I told you so. And by the way, it worked. So let's talk about what it's like now. Um, I wouldn't trade my life today for anything. Um, I have everything I need. I have more than I want. And it only keeps getting better. It really does. The promises that we read at the end of every meeting do come true, um, and they've happened for me. Uh, I Does it mean every day I get up and it's uh, lollipops and uh, bubble gum? No, I'm human, and we're gonna have days that are off. But no day compares to what it was like in those last days of drinking and using, because they were awful. Staying messed up is a lot of work. I mean, think about it. We gotta get rid of, we gotta get our what we want, we gotta hide it from everybody. We gotta use it what we can. We gotta think and worry about getting more and we gotta get rid of the trash. It's a full time job and I don't think about it anymore. Um, some things that I do today and I tell everybody that I sponsor a lot of people, by the way, I sponsor more people than I've ever heard of being done and it doesn't matter because I do what I can. Um, and I tell my guys the exact same thing I'm gonna tell y'all. Every day you gotta do one thing for your sobriety. You gotta do one thing for your recovery. Just one, at least. Um, for me, that means I get up and I type up two things I'm grateful for, and I send that out to around 800,000 people. That's what I do. I own a couple of recovery sites. I, I do have a website, YouTube channels, and I'm very vocal about recovery, and, uh, and it's helped people. And it's helped people I don't know. Um, and that's the coolest thing in the world. If somebody's life gets saved and I never even hear about it, guess who wins? I do. Selfishly, I do. Because I'm doing what I do keep my ass sober and it works 
So every day I do that. Every day I call my sponsor, John Mack, 48 years March. I call him every day. He's 78 years old. The guy's my best friend. My best friend. You know, and it's cool. We hang out, we do stuff. We don't we don't just sit around and talk about how bad we were. We we talk about normal people stuff. You know, and yeah, we talk about my sponsors, we talk about recovery, of course, you know, every day, but but we don't dwell on it. We dwell on the the part of experience, strength, and hope. You know, we talk about the positive attributes of recovery versus the negative effects of using, because we all know what they are. I just talked about them. We all know that, man. My story is your story is your story. Just different towns, different situations, and different people. Same stuff, it's miserable. So I, uh, I'm remarried to an amazing woman. I wouldn't trade it for the world. Um, she doesn't understand addiction. She doesn't understand alcoholism. This woman comes home from work. She works, she's a nurse, she does absurd hours. And she pours a glass of wine and drinks like two sips of it and falls asleep with it on the nightstand. I'm like, I still can't wrap my brain around that. I'm like, how do you fall asleep with it in your glass, more or less with anything in a bottle? You know, I mean, really? I don't get it. I never will get it. I'm okay with that. Um, alcohol and drugs are nothing more than an inanimate object to me today. If uh, there's a fifth of Jim Beam sitting right there with the top off of it, it means as much to me as that picture of some old lady over there who I don't know. It means nothing to me. I don't think about it. It doesn't cross my mind. People say, you know, you, can, uh, you can't go places. That's bullshit. I go anywhere I want to go today. Um, if I have a reason to be in a bar, which is not very often, I I'll be there uh, and I'll take care of what I need to take care of and I'll leave. Um, if I am at a wedding reception where alcohol is always served because everybody else can do it, I'm just one of the 10% that can't, it doesn't even phase me. I don't, I don't dwell on it. Um, I do my thing, I, I say congratulations and best wishes and, and I have dinner, I leave. And it's nothing. Um, my uh, home group, the Wilkins group, um, has become a, a, a real cornerstone of my sobriety because I'm there and I get to work with other alcoholics and addicts every single day. And the service work piece of it is what's fundamentally the key. Meeting makers make it bullshit. Meeting makers sit in chairs and drink coffee. It's people that put the action into the program that make it. And that's a fact. If you, in, don't get me wrong, meetings are good but you gotta do more than that. I sat in meetings six days a week for years, drunk, with beer and liquor in my car for when I left. Sometimes in my cup is tea. Yeah, that's bourbon tea, you know? And then I'd be up there picking up a nine month chip, right? Yeah, for who, my ego? Yeah, it's different, man. It, uh, I wouldn't trade what I have today for anything. And all I've gotta do is some simple things that have been suggested to me, and that's, Call a couple alcoholics every day and addicts every day, and I do. Call my sponsor once a day, and I do. List two things I'm great.